I'm going to start with this image. Does this look familiar to anyone? Hopefully not. This was March 31st, 2004, in Fallujah, Iraq, when four American Blackwater guards were ambushed, set on fire, mutilated, dragged through the streets, and strung up on the bridge over the Euphrates River. Pretty horrible, isn't it? This hit me especially hard because I'd just recently driven across that same bridge, and also because one of the guys killed was my brother's friend. They'd served in the Navy SEALs together. I was the CIA counterinsurgency analyst for Al Anbar Province in western Iraq, part of the dreaded Sunni Triangle. In a nutshell, my job was to make sense of the other, to figure out who was fighting us and why, what were their tactics, what was motivating them, where were they getting their funding, what was the leadership structure. Were they Saddam loyalists? Were they Islamic jihadists? Trying to paint a picture for our leaders of who, who it was that committed acts like that on the bridge. I worked closely with the military and special forces, and I even had to interrogate insurgents in Abu Ghraib prison. The closest I came to the front lines was supporting the war in Fal- the major battle in Fallujah that was a response to the attack on that bridge. I slept and worked in this tent with the other members of my team. I was the only female CIA official, and one of very few civilian women on the Marine base just outside Fallujah. Let's just say it was a good thing I grew up with brothers. <laughs> It's difficult to describe what that experience was like. The incredible, deafening noise and shock of the booms. Of mortars and rockets incoming and outgoing, the sense of chaos and confusion, the incredible fatigue, constantly running out to the sandbags nearby for protection. I felt this incredible sense of heavy responsibility to shed light on the confusion of war. It took a very heavy physical and emotional toll, and I couldn't see an end in sight. For every terrorist or insurgent we killed. It seemed that there were a hundred more ready to take their place. It felt like catching drops of water from a leaky faucet. It was a fruitless, hopeless effort. About a month later, I was staying in Ramadi with special forces at the, their base right here along the Euphrates River. One evening, I'd gone for a run and I went up to the roof to cool down. I was standing up here, right on this roof. And the first thing I noticed was the complete and utter stillness. It was so beautiful and peaceful and quiet. Such a contrast to what I had just experienced. It was so calming. I just wanted to lie back and float downstream in this peaceful river. I realized if I were to do that, I would end up a few miles downstream in Fallujah. Right underneath that bridge where the guards had hung, right amidst the fighting between the Marines and Iraqis. Whoa! What a contrast that those two things were happening in exactly the same space at the same time. The beautiful, flowing peace, this life-giving force of the river, amidst the death and destruction and bombs and chaos of war. This thought came to me out of the blue: Which will you choose? Which will you choose? It was clear that I couldn't focus on both at the same time. I'd been completely unaware of this peaceful, beautiful river amidst the war zone, and in that moment of peace and calm, the fear and stress of the conflict were gone completely. It was obvious to me at that moment which to choose: life or death. I choose the river. I said to myself. I want to decide with what was more powerful. No matter how many bombs go off, 
matter how much death and destruction, it couldn't flow, it couldn't affect the flow and trajectory and peace and life-giving force of that river. It was so obvious it was the more powerful thing. And in choosing, everything in my life changed in that moment. I have since dedicated the rest of my life to shedding light and inspiration on the dark issues of the Middle East through the Euphrates Institute, which I named after the Euphrates River. Back in Baghdad, I made an immediate switch as well. I vowed to stop catching drops of water from a leaky faucet and wanted to try to fix the, fix the faucet. I switched from counterinsurgency anal analysis to working directly with Iraqi political parties ahead of the country's first ever democratic elections. This was a complete change for me. For the first time, I was working side by side with Iraqis instead of interrogating them. For the first time, I started to see them as human beings, as people, and listen to their stories and work together with them. These were women who were running for the first parliament, part of 25% quota that was mandated for that first parliament, an incredible achievement. These were members of parliament that reflect the incredible ethnic and tribal diversity of Iraq. It was such a change, and one of my um, wonderful and fondest memories is my main duty after the elections was to be the liaison with the office of the Prime Minister, Ibrahim al Jafri. I really got to know him and his team very really well, and I think I must have reminded him of his three daughters because he loved to lecture me on my love life. <laughs> Tell me I needed to get married and settle down and not have such high standards. <laughs> Truth be told, eventually I did. <laughs> I still have high standards, by the way. Um, sorry, husband. <laughs> I'll never forget something he taught me about Islam. He was a very devout Muslim scholar and an Islamic theologian. And he said that in Islam, a person is viewed like a house. In a house, you have the outer door to get into the house and the inner door to get into the bedroom. You don't just march into someone's bedroom. You have to first go through the outer door and then through the inner door. He said, well, in Islam, the outer door is the heart and the inner door is the mind. You have to first reach a person through the heart and only then can you appeal to their logic and reason. Isn't that wonderful? I think that applies in every case. That has been a model for me in my personal and professional relationships. At my going away party, after nearly 21, no, after exactly 21 months in Iraq, what started out as a 90-day tour and turned into 21 months, it was a wonderful gathering of Iraqi friends. And I was so touched when the Prime Minister's spokesperson stood up and he said to the group, Janessa, we feel you are Iraqi. And it really felt like I'd come full circle, from seeing Iraqis as the enemy, to being part of them, to seeing from others to brothers. I'd come a long way from Fallujah. Pardon me. <sighs> Meaningful moment. <laughs> I want to step back a bit and tell you about why this transformation was so meaningful to me, about why from other, seeing people from others to brothers is so important. I want you to meet my brother, David. David has special needs and mental disabilities. He can't talk. He only knows a few words in sign language. His behavior is really unpredictable. You might call him an other. Some people are scared of him. Others make fun of him. Some have even been violent towards him. But to me, he's amazing. He has this incredible sense of innocence and purity and childlike wonder and enthusiasm. He'll stare at tire tracks for as long as you'll let him. He jumps into swimming pools and chortles and squeals in delight. He holds my hand and kisses me on the cheek and stares at me with the most intense, pure love. Where people see an other, 
I literally see my brother. I got my first taste of otherness at a very young age when I was 12 years old. My parents sent me to France for a year to live with a French family, and apparently that's a really good age to learn a language. <laughs> But at that point, I didn't know the family and I didn't speak a word of French. And I can remember for so long at each dinner table conversation as the family chatted and laughed amongst themselves, I felt in my own world. I was completely silenced. I was completely alone, cut off, in a world apart. Suddenly, I was the other, l'américaine, and it felt really horrible. I can imagine that each of us in this room has had experiences where we have been the other, and what that felt like. And maybe each of us can think about groups that we see as the other. Is it other races, other nationalities? Is it Muslims? Is it Republicans or Democrats? That's a hot topic these days. I want to take this idea of otherness to the extreme. Just recently, a couple weeks ago, I returned from our most recent Euphrates trip to the Middle East, and we had the occasion to meet with this incredible Jewish peace builder in Jerusalem for a Sabbath dinner, Shabbat dinner. She told us that part of her practice for peace, this idea of overcoming a sense of the other for her, was that she takes pictures of terrorists and meditates on them until she can find deep within herself a sense of empathy and compassion and even love for them, for terrorists. Our group was stunned, and I asked her, how do you do that? I can't imagine anything more difficult. She said, you just understand what's driving their actions. Even those, country, even those mass shooters in your country, the ones who kill innocent children, are isolated and depressed. These people create suffering because they are suffering. That was a model unlike any I'd ever heard. Another amazing example was Euphrates Institute's Visionary of the Year last year, a young Iraqi pianist by the name of Zuhal Sultan. Zuhal, at the age of 17, started the National Youth Orchestra of Iraq, where she brought together young people from all over the country in the middle of the war, Sunni, Shia, Kurdish, Christian, to play together and bridge divides um, through music. These students described the orchestra as their lifeline, as their way to be human, as their way to connect in a time of sectarian conflict and divisions. I call Zuhal the anti-ISIS, whereas ISIS is recruiting young people from all over the world to divide, to terrorize, to destroy, to enslave other people. Zuhal is literally recruiting people from all over the country to come together, be united, empower these young people, and be a symbol of hope and inspiration for their country and for all over the world. They've performed to sold-out audiences throughout Europe and the Middle East. It's an incredible example of what just one person can do. These examples can happen really in our everyday life and experience. Our local Euphrates Institute chapter, we have chapters all over the world, our local chapter right here in Northern California organized a visit to the local mosque to learn more about Islam and to meet some Muslims in our area. It was an amazing experience. The mosque goers were ex exceedingly friendly. They welcomed us, they thanked us again and again for coming. No one has come from the community to visit us in this way. All of the men had accents and seemed to be foreign born. We listened to the sermon, we met the attendees, we prayed together side by side. I'm standing with a Muslim woman I've never met before or spoken to. It was a very powerful, unifying experience. The imam appealed to our basic humanity. He said, don't we all breathe the same air? Don't we all shed tears when we're grieving, bleed when we're hurt? We must remember that the only way we differ is in our religion. We're all human beings first. 
As we left, one of our chapter members came up to me and said, I can see how this kind of simple encounter can change the world. This, for me, put a human face on Islam. And then as we chatted, we thought, well, it's also doing that for these mosque-goers. This is putting a human face for them on their community. And wouldn't you be less likely to attack your community if you feel a part of it? Wouldn't you feel less likely to buy into all of this extremist rhetoric out there if you can tune it out because you know who your community members are, you feel like you belong, you feel a part of your community, you don't feel like the other. I invite you to reflect on who the other is to you. Who is that other? And to maybe, just maybe open just a crack to having an encounter with that other, to learning something new about your other, to having a fresh experience with your other, to opening up to a river of possibility running right through the middle of your concept of the other. Maybe it was there all along and you didn't notice it, just like for me in the Euphrates River flowing in the middle of the war zone. There is incredible power when just a few of us do this. Studies show it doesn't take two-thirds of people to create social change. It doesn't even take half of us. It just takes a small percentage of us to create massive social change. Studies out of Stanford University, social scientist named Dr. Everett Rogers started studying in the 1960s how social change happened. And he observed everything from the adoption of the fax machine to hybrid corn in Iowa to nuclear disarmament. What he found is that at the beginning, it's about 2% of the population he called innovators were the first to adopt a new idea or mindset. You know, the first to buy the iPhone or the new gadget. They're the innovators. Once 5% of the population accepts a new idea, those are called the early adopters. Once 5% it's considered embedded. So the new idea, the new mindset, it, the seeds are planted in society. Then somewhere between 5 and 20 percent of adoption, it hits the tipping point, after which point the change is unstoppable. It reaches the entire rest of the population, the entire rest of the curve. So all it takes is between 5 and 20 percent to hit that tipping point for massive social change. This gets me so fired up. What if you and I could be part of reaching that tipping point for change, to creating a world not of others, but of brothers? Imagine that. That is possible with just a few of us, adopting a change, adopting a new idea or mindset. I want to leave you with the same question that came to me that changed my life by the Euphrates River. And that is, which will you choose? Thank you.